Hi, my name is Bethany Iser. I'm president of the Cures Foundation, which is comprehensive understanding via research and education into schizophrenia. And today I'm here with Dr. Eric Messmore, who is a psychiatric physician, professor here at Northeast Ohio Medical University, and also a board member of the Cures Foundation. And I'm here to ask Dr. Messmore today, is there a relationship between cannabis and psychosis? Uh, well, thanks, Bethany. It's a great question that you ask about is there a relationship between cannabis and psychosis? And the answer, the answer is absolutely and strongly yes. In our today's world in the United States, we're having a movement to um, make medical, me, to make marijuana recognized as a medicinal substance. Um, at current moment, I believe 33 states plus the District of Columbia um, allow for the medical use of marijuana. And in many cases, it's the only use that uh, marijuana can be given. In other words, in some states, you can have it both for recreational purposes and medicinal purposes. Mm -hmm. But in the majority of states that have made it legal, um, it is simply as a medicinal substance. So we have this concept of medical marijuana. The thing is, this is not a new concept at all. Uh, we actually had medical marijuana in Western medicine, by this I mean Europe and the United States and Mexico, for, well, since about 1850. Um, the cannabis was introduced into Western medicine by physicians in, in British India, and it was widely used in medicine. And uh, if you read medical textbooks from that era, you will find again and again, cannabis is listed as a medicinal substance. In, in one of the textbooks that I read, they actually go so far as to make recommendations for the physician on how many ounces of cannabis you keep in your office and whether or not you should keep it in your house call bag. And the answer was, yes, you should keep it in your house call bag. So they had, so it was, it was um, the other thing about that era is that cannabis was just like everything else. It was medicinal. So they didn't really have any moral hesitations or qualms about using it. It was just an ordinary medicine like anything else. Um, so the textbooks that existed um, taught us or taught physicians at the time what it's good for. And indeed, many of the things that they were recommending it for in 1880 are exactly the same thing that people are recommending it for today. Nausea, for example, pain. Uh, it was frequently recommended for insomnia. It was recommended for um, agitation associated with Alzheimer's disease, for example. So our predecessors, if they will, got it right on what you can use cannabis for. They also, being physicians, were aware that anything that's really a medicine really actually has risk. Um, so side effects and benefits are two sides of the same coin. And they would reliably describe psychosis as a side effect of, of medical use of cannabis. They would warn that at higher doses or with prolonged use, you could have what looks like psychosis that evolves into a permanent state, as well as cognitive impairments and some other, other, um, other side effects. So, so the, the cannabis is associated with psychosis as a side effect, not a new story at all. Been around, been known to Western medicine since the 1850s. What would you say to teenagers who are thinking about trying cannabis? I can certainly understand the desire to try cannabis. I read about cannabis in the news, and it's, it's hard not to read cannabis in the news these days. Um, earlier this year, the Washington Post ran a story recommending that parents smoke cannabis with their kids as a way of bonding. I've been interested in the cannabis, in, I've been interested in the what I call psychiatric adverse effects of cannabis for about as long as I've been a psychiatrist because I did my psychiatric residency training in Oregon and practice in Oregon. And Oregon is an extraordinarily cannabis-friendly state. So lots of my patients were using cannabis and uh, I got very curious to what extent is the cannabis use helping them or to what extent is their cannabis use causing them to be my patient. Um, so I got genuinely curious about this for, for quite a long time. Well, I've, I've seen a lot of cases where cannabis was involved in, was associated with some kind of psychiatric presentation, anxiety, depression, panic attacks, psychosis. Um, and of course, 
as a single observer looking at a single case, I can't say that one causes the other or that they just occurred by random coincidence. But eventually I worked in locations where we would get um, patients from all across the country. And again and again and again, cannabis was part of the picture. I would see, schizoph I would see something that looked exactly like schizophrenia mm -hmm. in middle-aged men with no family history or no prior psychiatric history. It was only 20 years of regular cannabis use that was going on. Would their psychosis go away? once they stop taking marijuana? Um, the, the interesting thing about the, there are, three, there are three relationships between cannabis and psychosis that, I can, that, that, are, that are known or suspected by clinicians. Uh, first is the, what we call the acute side effect. So people can smoke cannabis and within, within minutes to hours develop paranoia. Occasionally they can develop hallucinations. Um, a study from New Zealand that looked at about a thousand cannabis users mm -hmm. uh, in that survey, about 15% of the people who used cannabis reported an acute episode of paranoia or psychosis from it. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that, and that relationship has been known again for a very, very, very long time. There is another phenomenon where people smoke cannabis typically more on a more regular basis and develop some uh, a psychosis which looks more pr more prolonged. So rather than just a few hours after they smoke it, um, it seems to be there and tends not to go away or people continue to smoke and it's just, it never really fully subsides. So that, I'll call that schizophrenia-like psychosis or better to say a persistent psychosis associated with cannabis use. If people stop at that point, almost always it goes away. So um, it seems like if you have this persistent psychosis with regular use and you stop, you can make it go away. Um, one study that I know um, studied this phenomena in particular, and it suggested that people who then remain off of cannabis will tend not to have any recurrence of psychiatric symptoms, whereas those who resume cannabis use will have a recurrence of psychosis or anxiety or some psychiatric symptom, and that may not go away. Uh, in my, now we're getting into an area where we don't have a whole lot of science, we have more clinical experience. Um, and in my experience, as well as in those of my colleagues, the, when it comes back, it can persist a very long time. Mm -hmm. And that form of persistent psychosis associated with cannabis tends to respond more poorly to treatments. Uh, it's more difficult to get to go away. I understand that cannabis is really most dangerous in teenagers and can cause lifelong psychiatric problems. Is that true? Uh, certainly. the. It is using as a teenager or using any, any point before adulthood is an extremely high risk proposition. Uh, the, the most prominent of the active ingredients in cannabis is, is a compound called THC. Uh, THC is designed by nature to interact with a set of proteins in our brain called the endocannabinoid system. And the endocannabinoid system is highly important for telling the brain how to grow itself. So if we um, add outside cannabinoids uh, in the form of cannabis, we mess up the internal signals. Our, our body actually makes a, a compound called anandamide. That's what our brains are, pr are producing to help guide this endocannabinoid system to do its brain growing activity. Um, and when we put in outside signals, we distort that messaging and um, and have a good chance of disrupting brain development. So nobody can look inside of a human brain to say exactly this is happening there. So we can't we can't prove that directly, but we but we can infer that by the fact that um, by far and away the highest risk use is adolescent onset regular use of cannabis. That's uh, where you have the the highest risk of a persistent psychosis. And to the point of persistent psychosis. Um, there have now been at least 11 large-scale peer-reviewed studies which look at the relationship between long-term cannabis use and later risk of a schizophrenia diagnosis. And every one of those studies shows that the more person, the more that a person has been exposed to cannabis, the higher their later risk for schizophrenia goes up. On average, the risk increases by 300%. But in some studies, looking at um, the use of high potency cannabis products, the risk of schizophrenia or schizophrenia-like diagnosis rockets by about 700% over baseline. 700%.
Yeah. yeah the, the, so, yeah, with, with high potency, high frequency use uh, beginning in adolescence. So the Cures Foundation is interested in bringing a simple message to teenagers. If your friends are doing it, don't touch it. Not worth it. Too big a risk. Yeah, I think that if you want to use cannabis, um, it's best to wait until your brain is fully developed. Um, the best guess about when that brain is fully developed is age 25. Um, but you know, the later the better. And if uh, the 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 urge to younger people. Um, teenagers and adolescents are the group with the, that perceives the lowest risk to cannabis and are the most likely to initiate cannabis use. Um, data suggests between 10% uh, and 20% of adolescent onset cannabis experimenters will progress into frequent or regular use of cannabis. Yeah. And among that 10 or 20% that become regular users, then you have this risk of elevation of later, later onset of psychosis by 3 to 7%. Um, in addition, adolescent onset and regular persistent cannabis use is associated with decreasing scores on memory and cognitive problem solving tasks. Um, it increases the risk of anxiety, panic attacks. Um, it does have a, there are signals in the literature that it increases the risk of suicide attempt as well. Wow.